Regular meeting of the Virginia City Council to order. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome, everyone. Are there any amendments to the agenda? All right, hearing none, we will move forward. We have two visitors scheduled to be on the agenda. We have Matthew Vaughn, who is here. I'm assuming Scott will be joining us. He said this morning he would be here. Okay, great. So, Matthew, welcome. Thank you. Uh, where would you like me to just stand? Sure. sure. Thank you. Where might be best? You're probably good right there. Is he good right there? Yeah. Good here? Okay. Great. Great. I have uh, some handouts for everyone. I'll just take one and pass it around. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Matthew Vaughn. I work for the Lake Champlain Basin Program. Um, so if you haven't heard of us, we exist to coordinate and fund efforts that improve and protect uh, water quality and habitat in the Lake Champlain Basin. Um, so what you have in front of you is our state of the lake and Ecosystems Indicators Report. So this, um, there we go. Oh yeah, please, please, if anyone is interested. So we find this is a good starting point for conversation. I mean, I was asked here today by Alderman Small and, and Matt Chabot to, I think, give an overview of kind of where Virginia sits in the larger picture of Lake Champlain um, and, and also what you can do um, to help improve water quality. And I know you're already uh, involved in a lot of, of efforts already. I heard some chatter about wastewater treatment facility upgrades, so it's already on your mind. So uh, if you wouldn't mind just opening up here and just looking at a map, um, the inside cover there, that is Lake Champlain, as you probably know. Uh, you can see that there are three jurisdictions that drain to the lake, Vermont, New York, and Quebec. So part of what the basin program does is coordinates these three jurisdictions, gets into the same table to work on these uh, shared goals to improve water quality. Uh, if you kind of flip through, let's see, a few more pages to another map, you'll see um, a lake kind of coated out in different colors. And this is to illustrate that we have kind of a diverse um, set of lake segments within our lake. So we have different water quality goals for different parts of Lake Champlain. And I'll focus um, my brief time tonight on uh, phosphorus and cyanobacteria. It's one of the main challenges we face, um, something you've probably heard about. So one of the um, issues that we have actually going on right now are cyanobacteria blooms. So cyanobacteria are naturally occurring types of bacteria. They are actually everywhere in the world, but they become a problem when the balance of nutrients are kind of out of whack. So uh, when there's too much phosphorus in the water for them to uh, eat, they grow to out of control levels, and this can sometimes produce uh, toxins. So at their best, they're a nuisance and they look ugly and um, they can cause skin irritation, things like that, but at their worst, they're, they're actually uh, liver and neurotoxins, so that can be really bad. So to prevent or to reduce the uh, occurrence of cyanobacteria blooms, we try to limit the amount of phosphorus in the water. So if you could flip over to page, uh, let's see, 11. You see a bunch of graphs there, and we won't go into detail tonight, but uh, these are, um, graphs that represent the phosphorus concentration. And where you see the red, that's when we're over the targeted phosphorus concentration that we're going for in the lake. So in order to reduce that in the lake down the road, we're trying to limit how much phosphorus is getting to the lake through our rivers and uh, tributaries. And of course, phosphorus comes from many different sources, um, agricultural sources and farming activities, um, urban runoff, uh, for example, like here in Virgins, um, and all, and, um, wastewater treatment facilities, of course, from, from sewer inputs. Uh, so there are, there are many sources. Um, and if you turn the page one more time, this, uh, there's a lot more graphs here, but this is showing uh, the inputs of phosphorus uh, from these main tributaries. And actually that photo on the bottom left there, that is Otter Creek, I believe, after Tropical Storm Irene. So you can actually see the sediment uh, being delivered to the lake. And within that sediment, of course, um, there's phosphorus bound up there. So there's, uh, there's some kind of circle or donut graphs on the right uh, hand side of this booklet here. 
Um, and you'll see kind of the contributions of phosphorus from different land sectors. So we have developed land in the yellow. So that's uh, when we're talking about Vergennes, that's really where you are sitting. Um, it's an urban area and that's um, a, a major contributor of phosphorus, 16% to the lake. Um, of course, agricultural sources are one of our main contributors at 38%. And of course, we have forests, um, stream bank erosion is a big one as well. And then wastewater treatment facilities specifically uh, contribute 6% of the phosphorus to the lake. Um, the next two graphs are, are really to illustrate that although um, agricultural areas contribute most of the phosphorus to the lake, um, actually, if you're looking at an acre by acre basis, developed land, such as the city of Virgins, contributes more per square mile or per acre uh, than agricultural areas. So it is, even though it's uh, contributing less overall, um, there's less land, less developed land in the basin. Um, so it is uh, an issue we need to address. So with that, uh, I want to talk also about the Vermont 2016 TMDL. So this is, um, TMDL stands for Total Maximum Daily Load. And this is uh, something that the EPA issued to the state of Vermont to try to make a budget for the amount of phosphorus that can go into different lake segments of Lake Champlain. So where Virgin sits is in the Otter Creek segment, um, which includes Otter Creek, Little Otter Creek, and Lewis Creek. Um, and for example, the allocation for that segment is 107 metric tons per year. So a metric ton, if you were to picture a big African black rhino, that's about one metric ton. Um, so it's kind of like a small dump truck, you might say, of phosphorus. We're allowed 107 metric tons per year. We're not there yet. Uh, and actually, uh, we'll require about 23.6% reduction overall uh, from 2010 levels. And that's why we are uh, going with an all-in approach to try to hit all these different land sectors, agricultural areas, urban areas to try to reduce that input of phosphorus. Um, so let's see. Again, and going back to that graph of phosphorus in the lake, um, we are our target for, so back on page 11, the target concentration we're going for in the Otter Creek segment is 14 uh, micrograms per liter, which is what we think uh, would make for a healthy Otter Creek segment. And you can see there that we're, we're hitting it some years, we're not hitting it other years. We have work to do to get our uh, contributions of phosphorus down. Um, so I know Virgins has taken several steps to do your part. Um, we pitched in some funds uh, a few years ago to help you with your uh, master planning for stormwater. Um, this was, I think, an enhanced BMP, we call it, grant, which contributed $50,000 um, to a match of $10,000, I believe, from the city to do that master planning in collaboration with Watershed Consulting Associates. Uh, and that, um, as you probably know, I'm not telling, I'm not telling you too much, you already know, but um, that identified, I think, five prioritized projects and went to a 30% design for those projects. Um, so I'd like to tell you about some of the opportunities we have to help you continue to fund those types of projects. And again, as an urban setting, your role is really to reduce that stormwater input um, so I don't think I said this, but the, your city, I believe, is about 13% impervious surfaces. So these are hard asphalt, uh, roads, driveways, buildings. These are surfaces that are not um, allowing water to infiltrate and causing that runoff of water and phosphorus and sediments to go directly to the lake. That's part of why a developed land area contributes more phosphorus per square mile than an undeveloped or agricultural area. So. Um, now that you have this master plan and you have some 30% designs and some ideas of where you might, might want to make these stormwater improvements, you're welcome to come back to, the, to this category to apply for funds to actually implement, implement these stormwater practices. So we have a grant opportunity opening um, in just a week or two, actually. It'll, it will be open to, uh, until mid-November. Uh, again, it's called the Enhanced uh, Best Management Practices Grant Category. Um, and this will uh, allow for up to projects of up to $125,000 for implementation and then also up to $50,000 for uh, planning or design. So if you have something like from your master plan that is nearly ready to go uh, to implementation, you can come in uh, for that grant. You can partner with a consulting agency or apply as the city um, for, the, for those funds. Also, Neil Kamen is, is joining us here as an expert with 
as for uh, the state programs, there's many different mechanisms that the state has to fund projects like these um, with all sorts of um, advantages that you would have for, for loans to the city. So please use him as a resource for those. And so I think I'll leave it there. And again, this is really, this document is, can um, be a springboard for conversations or questions you may have. So if anything came up, please let me know if you have questions. We can talk about anything that you're particularly interested in, or we can leave it there. Anyone have any questions? I think for, you know, one thing that we've heard a lot about in this room, at least I've heard about in the last year, is, um, you know, figuring out um, how to prioritize, and especially with combined uh, sewage overflows and understanding where in our infrastructure we need to think about um, what we tackle first. Um, do you, I mean, does the organization have uh, an idea of looking at an urban area like Virgen's and saying, you know, these are your, you know, these are the main places that you want to focus on first? Yeah. So I think a lot of that was done in the master plan, the stormwater master plan. Mm -hmm. I just flipped through it today to remind myself uh, what you all received as, as part of this package. Um, this, this went into detail and not only uh, prioritized several, several of the large impervious surfaces that you have and how to deal with those, but also um, mapped out your sewer network. Used the, the data that the city had, but also went out and did some field surveys to figure out where the sewer lines are, what they're made of, and where there may be leaks uh, or um, CS, uh, areas that would be contributing to CSOs. Um, so we don't have a f um, the function to directly do that work for you, but if you felt like there were gaps in what you received, you can come back for, an, with, for another grant to um, say, hey, we need the, more work to be done to prioritize these projects, and we can likely uh, look, at, look at giving you that funding. Thank you. Um, yeah. That answers the question. Yes. Um, are there are there any conditions on the on the funding? I mean, I know I know uh, certain programs have limitations in terms of whether those funds can be applied to a project that say uh, should have had a stormwater permit or, or needed a stormwater mm -hmm. permit, and now you're using these funds to actually obtain one. Right. So now is a good time to apply for our funding. Uh, because although, so you're right, for our, for our funding and for many funding sources, we cannot grant funds to bring a municipality or other entity into compliance when they're out of compliance, but we can help you get into uh, compliance for a future requirement. So for example, if you have um, a requirement that this, the state is changing requirements, for example, for three acre permits and munis municipal roads, uh, um, their requirements are I think coming into effect those 2021. Are Those are in effect. Yeah. Okay. So the okay. Well, so there are. If there's any permit or um, requirement that is not yet in effect, mm -hmm. we can help you get there beforehand. Uh, but not if you've already been issued a notice that you're out of compliance. A good example of of what Matthew is saying is this: the thing he, he referenced a three acre permit, and that's a provision of the Vermont Clean Water Act of 2015. Um, and what that does is it requires any three acre impervious parcel, so hard surface on which water runs off, that's not treated to at least the level of the 2002 stormwater standards, that that has to come into compliance with modern standards or the best that it can do. And so one good example is the state is working um, with some project partners at the high school to actually bring the high school into compliance before the three acre permit provisions kick in and, in, and are imposed upon the high school. And I think pretty sure that we're actually treating the high school and the elementary school as a package inside of that agreement. Um, and that's an agreement that's actually jointly funded between Matthew's organization, the Basin Program, and the DEC, State of Vermont. Right. So you're, you're funding the planning, and we're funding the execution. Right, the high school was one of the sites that was identified as, yep. a, as a high so, priority. So then that is actually bringing that into compliance. Yeah. Right. Because it's currently, I mean, it's identified as a three-acre site. Correct. And, you know, so that means all that you know what it means, engineering feasibility analysis, offsets, all that. But basically it means that we're going to cover that before it kicks in. And that cost rains down upon the school budget, which then would flow over into our municipal tax bills. So, try to catch that. And now it is actually, I know that we're dealing with the rain garden stormwater with the, the high school and then we got caught in the middle of a change of 
how things were funded, and they're like, well, you're kind of in no man's land now. Explain more so I can try and help answer that. We were in the process of, we got a, you can probably help me some, we, yeah, got a, so we got a grant and then it was for feasibility and then we couldn't get a grant to execute. Yeah, so, so I, believe, I believe Mike was helping with the funding, but they, the, the, the grant that they were getting money for um, was to bring it through the 30%, which, yep. which um, they were exploring that opportunity and apparently the, the next funding source <coughs> they were looking at was that provision about bringing things into compliance. I think that's really good. Okay, so there's a couple different funding mechanisms that can be brought to bear for the types of projects you're talking about. One which I have met with Matt and with your mayor about is um, what are called clean water block grants. So the way the state is changing how we put money on the ground is instead of put money on the ground at 15, 10, $5,000 increments to individual partners, we're putting much larger blocks of money out on the ground to regional planning commissions and natural resources conservation districts who are well equipped to then turn around and work with folks like Brent to execute the projects. So I think some of the projects that we were talking about inside that stormwater master plan, not the school one, but others, will fall into the clean water block grants that are available. And those are, that's money that's in the system right now and ready to go. So when you've got a 30% design ready to go and the city is ready to actually execute on it, you can go to that block grant tour and finalize the engineering through that funding source, pay for the permitting through that funding source, and execute the project through that funding source. With, um, right now, a maximum match rate of 20% right now. So that's constantly a piece that's in flux is the grant match rates. Any other comments or questions? Very well, thank you. Okay, thanks, thank for you. thanks for joining us. Moving on, were there any questions on the warrants that were circulated for approval? He is not. And then there were visitors without. This is on the agenda. Oh, thank you. Sorry, yeah, thank you. It's okay. Any Just questions on the warrant? Nope, he's not here. All right, sit. Did you have a question you wanted to ask, Lynn? It was answered. It was answered. Great. Approval of the minutes. I'll make the motion to approve the minutes. Is there a second? Second. Motion made and seconded. Were there any corrections? I had a couple. Uh, page one, third line up. Northlands and that the center on McDonough Drive is currently fourth in the country, not county. And uh, then on the final page, under executive session, we should in fact state that the council approved the clerk treasurer's rate of pay as proposed in the city budget presented by the city manager. Any others? All right, if there aren't any other comments, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Great, thank you. Opposed? Minutes are approved. I see a number of folks out in the audience today. Um, if you are here for something that is not on the agenda, now is your opportunity. Tim, for, excuse me, Tim, were you here for a, ah, there's Scott. We're actually going to halt this section and turn this over to you, Scott. Wait. Sorry to. Sorry, yeah. That's okay. They all have uh, a copy of the that they print out, right? Yep. Um, we don't have any presentation ability to do it. No. I, I did bring a good check. Um, so it was uh, the concept, and what, what I shared in the slides is uh, basically trying to utilize Macintosh Park, which is basically just an overgrown jungle at this point in time. Um, and you know, with the growth of, or the regrowth of, of mountain biking, and basically you'll see a picture of a map that demonstrates uh, 
where the key locations are around Vermont. Obviously, those are bigger complexes, but I think that we can benefit from having this uh, feature uh, you know, right in our back door. So there's a number of people who are mountain bikers locally, and um, I think that, you know, trying to have another form of recreation in town is a, is a benefit. So uh, the goal is really to put this together as a, uh, a membership group, a uh, volunteer group, and uh, build these trails, maintain these trails, and, and but utilize land that the city already owns. Um, I think uh, Tim had, we met with the Recreation Committee, and they had said that uh, you know, basically it was a, a, a good idea, and so now we're for the select board. So is that all within city-owned land, or something to go on the state-owned land, you know? Uh, I believe it's all city owned. I think it's 10 to 15 acres. I didn't, I didn't know, so I was curious. So, yeah. We haven't asked, we haven't asked the state for anything. I want to say 11.4 acres. I got a water. It's actually a bunch of um, Yeah, so uh, Scott came for the Recreation Committee, and we kind of we talked about it in, in terms of recreation, and we're only a concept at this point of a you know pedestrian bike trail around the gens and um, they thought the mountain bike trail itself and I myself am trying to remain completely neutral here I'm here only on behalf of the recreation committee although it's hard not to get excited but um, you know I asked I, I wanted to advocate for the city and I asked for four things which uh, Scott put in print his presentation. It's the, um, the four points of uh, not the <coughs> now not having any finances involved in it, and a commitment to prioritize and implementation of the section of the citywide ped loop through McIntosh Park. Uh, I will say the concept is to connect all our parks with a path and, and take people through them. Um, Clear expectation of maintenance. He's, he put that in print as well. And then the, the important thing, the most important thing, is a six to nine year check-in time because of the Jan's economic corridor. You know, we don't really know what's going to happen in that region of the city. And Scott has um, agreed to all of that, put it right in his presentation as part of their mission. And I, I think it's great. You know, I've, I've really come to realize that for the near future of Virginia's recreation. It's definitely going to be like a public-private partnership. And this seems like a great way to start that. And I really look forward <coughs> to uh, Scott being a longtime partner. And I'll leave this sort of thing in the city. I mean, other than probably a sign and sort of rules and waivers and you know, respect and right away for pedestrian access, I think there you know, really won't be a lot of infrastructure that will be adding. It's really just modifying the landscape, clearing the trails. And, you know, so if it has to go away, it has to go away. Matt, would there be any liability insurance issues there? I would I'll reach out to VLCT and find out. Um, I anticipate, Scott, I have not been up to uh, the NEK um, trails, but I assume there's a disclaimer or a waiver or something that needs to be um, executed prior to people being able to use that facility. Um, up at King of Trails? Yeah. Um, they're, they have an online, I mean, you have to pay to, to, to do it, and I don't know whether that, um, so you actually have to sign their waiver, but you know, I don't think that it's any different than someone walking on the sidewalk or, or riding a bike through town or you know, any of the other hazards that we have mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as a city. And do you anticipate charging at Macintosh as well? Uh, no. I mean, the idea of just being a member or, or a volunteer, volunteer driven organization. The Donald McIntosh's grave is on the back side of that mountain, or that hill. Um, and last time I was there, which was years ago, it, it's just like a flat piece of marble in is the ground. Flagpole, flagpole is the no, that, that, that's where his house was. You, you follow a path up behind that hill, up towards the solar panels, mm -hmm. and you'll see it. But I just think that that would have to be protected in some way, Sure. somehow. I mean, it would be a simple fence, but just so no one is, you know, damaging it any more than it probably already is. Okay. Is there any thought of parking in case people come from a distance to, to 
to do the mountain biking, they'll have a place to put their car so it's not in the road. <coughs> We've thought about that. There is an entrance sort of where the solar panels are, but I don't know if that's state land um, at that point, or whether we have to get you know, one or two spots there. If there's a trail connecting to the parking lot over, you know, in Ferrisburg or yeah, I mean, other I places to park. Is, you know, opening up the rail trail, and that, you know, I know that's been a discussion around town for a long time. This, you know, keeps it coming up. Is there any talk about trying to connect this with the proposed Triangle Trail? That's like New Haven to Bristol to Virginia. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not familiar with the Triangle Trail. That's, I know that's more of an on road. Yeah. 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 Is it a road night? From uh, just, I have a lot of uh, friends and uh, who mountain bike, and in Middlebury, in Burlington, in uh, in Virgins, and you know they're getting their cars and they're driving up to the Green Mountains. They're going to Waterbury. They're going to Richmond. They're going all over the place um, after work on the weekends. It, it's there's a lot of folks who are doing it and um, you know I know you brought in here you know how much Kingdom Trails you know is impacting the regional economy I think it's a great addition um, that's not necessarily lake based it can happen later in the fall um, and to really drive people you know through Virgins who may not be coming or may not have come in the first place so right. or, or, or attract people who say you know Feature why I want to work in exactly. Yeah, yeah. Totally. I mean, it's not a it's not a destination. It's probably not big enough, but it's a great asset to have. I mean, right? yeah, absolutely, absolutely. How big are some of these other parks? I mean, King Trails is 150 miles of trails. So <laughs> but but you know, Waterbury Stowe area just has a couple small Katy Hill. There's a couple very right. small, you know, and Compact. it can build a bunch of different trails and routes and make it interesting for a day. Well, King of Trails is hard to see problems, too, haven't they? Act 1, I don't know. So they're charging, and so now they're not non-profit anymore. Oh, that's interesting. And so they're going to... It, I don't know if you... King of Trails has run into some Act 250 problems because they're not considered a non-profit now because they're charging. So there's, there's conflict as to whether or not they can do what they're doing in some of the areas. <coughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know, and I know it's, you know, it's all uh, landowners giving permission to the land. Mm -hmm. Commercial development. So, so is this something okay. then that would fall under the supervision of the Recreation Committee in the end? I so would... It's a, I mean, as a private enterprise, sort of. Right. I would hesitate to say yes at this point, just because there's not enough infrastructure to the Recreation Committee. Right. Like once we uh, get the um, recreation coordinator position established and you know have a sustaining finances for that, I could definitely see this going under that preview. But I, at this point, I think it's just um, goodwill of citizens that's going to keep it. Great. So we have we haven't opened this up to you know front porch forum discussion or whatever right. yet because we really kind of want to get this part done. <laughs> It seems like the council generally approves moving the concept forward. And if that's the case, I'll start with VLCT. Uh, that'll be a gating issue for us. And then it might be prudent um, for myself and uh, Scott to take a walk through the park up there and maybe get over to Richmond and Waterbury and look at a smaller scale opportunity, see if we can't mirror that here in Virginia, and we'll bring something back to the council as soon as possible. Good. And I think we should have Rochester? some sort of formal understanding between the parties that we can document. It would have to be, absolutely. absolutely. So we need to make yep. sure that's part of it. Any other questions about this issue? Just say the Recreation Committee's meeting tomorrow night, 6 o'clock here. Great. So if anybody wanted to comment on this, I would think that would be a great time. Great. First thing on the agenda. Perfect. Thank you both. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Thanks, good Scott. idea. Sorry to interrupt. Sounds just fine. Now we will get back to the citizen comments that are not otherwise on the agenda. And might there be any? Very well. Hearing none, we'll move on to business. First item of business, Virginia's Police Department long-term budget strategy. 
I guess I'm. You want me to <laughs> totally drive this? <laughs> to totally drive well, no, this? No, 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 I, I actually will. I've given this a, a lot of thought, and I think that what we, what we learned in our most recent um, aggravations and discussions is that we need to look very strategically at how we assist our manager in the budgeting process. And that includes what we think is an appropriate cost per department. And it's essentially our opinion. It's important that we all remember that the charter says we have nothing to do with the city budget. We are responsible for setting the tax rate. And that our city manager is our employee whom we empower to develop budgets. We, of course, should be assisting him along the way, but we need to be mindful of the fact that we empower this person to do this job. So as we move forward, we know that one of the main discussion topics in our last discussions was mostly about the percentage of our police budget to the overall percentage of the city budget. I, didn't, I said percentage one too many times, I think. Uh, we are now at 39% of uh, our overall city budget is allocated to the police department. I think we've all sort of agreed that we would like to see the, um, the bonded debt removed from that budget and placed as a capital line item. And uh, that will have not insignificant effect on that percentage. It will drop it, but it, it may not be at a level at which we're all happy. I don't think any of us is really happy that we, we enacted a tax increase that effectively left us with the status quo. And as we move forward and as we get closer to developing a budget for next year, we need to have discussions sooner rather than later. And a lot of that means we need to decide what is really important to us. And that is, is not just a small group of people, it's what we think is best for the people that sent us here to make decisions. So on that note, um, we have a long-term budget strategy as an item of business tonight. And I know that it's very easy for us to say that we need to have a discussion about that. And I think we need to have that discussion tonight. Um, not in a month, not in three months. I think we need to determine how we want to develop our budgets in the future. <coughs> so with that, I've only actually spoken to uh, one or two of you about this topic. And uh, I, I have some thoughts. Um, they're only my ideas and opinions. And I'm looking to hear what everyone else has to say on this topic. I, I think that the first thing, um, and, and Jeff and I've talked and I've spoken with Matt as well, um, you know, in my opinion, we're, we go about and we have gone about the budgeting process um, not in the best manner that we can. Um, you know, where we are now, um, Matt does not necessarily have any point on the horizon to aim for. It puts him in a relatively untenable situation that I hope we don't wind up in next year. Um, so with that being said, I think that it is important for us to develop a strategy. I think it's important for us to have uh, a discussion you know, from a 10,000 foot view in terms of what our priorities are. Um, and I as. Have a, I have a family emergency. I've got to go. Okay. I would like to have some input on this because yep. this is the first time I'm hearing about it. I will be back. Okay. And I go. apologize sincerely. Go. Do we, um, because Lynn's leaving, do we want to. I would respectfully table list? recommend that we table this. Table it? Yeah. I'm so sorry. No, please, Lynn. No, no, no. no, let's table it. All right. Thank you, everyone. We will. Um
Didn't hear. Yeah, me either. All right, we'll bring this up. Uh, all right, let's move on to the DRB appointments. So moved. You like the like the the package there? Like the package. Reappointment of Brent Rakowski, Don Peabody, Steve Rappaport, and Lowell Bertrand as alternate, and Carrie McFarlane is joining. We have a motion and a second. Bill. Bill. Questions, comments? It's okay for me. Do you have a comment? <laughs> yeah. Do you have a comment? Do you have a comment? <laughs> all right. <laughs> Hearing no discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none. Thank you all. All reappointed, yes. Thank you all. Lister position. Motion made and seconded. Any questions, comments? He in fact is, and he has a copy of the Lister's Handbook, and he's he's ready and raring to go. All right. I will offer him any advice if he Perfect. Ever needs it. He will be happy to hear that. Great. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Before he changes his mind. We have a new Lister. Uh, municipal policy and codes for Gen Thank Senior Housing. Thank you. So I have a document, folks. This is uh, from the Vermont Community Development Program. And basically what they require, uh, this is specific to the uh, Senior Housing Project over on Armory Lane. They require um, the council to sign off on the fact that we are compliant to amongst other things, EEO, uh, equal opportunity, fair housing policies. These are all things that are you know, best practices within our municipality. Uh, we do have an excessive use of force policy within our police department. Um, so it's really um, you know, drug, play, drug free workplace act. So enable to, to, for us to be able to tap into the grant money, we have to be compliant uh, with these specific programs, which in my review we are um, and it does require a signature of our legislative bar body to um, be submitted for the grant application itself. That entire project is moving along well. Uh, we're still optimistic that we could see shovels in the dirt uh, early fall. So, so this is for the, uh, not for the elderly, it's for the... Uh, I'm sorry, it's the... Um, it's senior, housing. senior housing, yes. Senior yeah. No, it's not, it wasn't senior housing. It's, it's affordable housing, wasn't it? Yeah. You know, what's it's the, a mix. What's it called, Joan? Mixed. Mixed housing? Yeah, it's it's actually senior and affordable. Right. Yeah. Right. So part of it is senior, we still have to... <laughs> right. Well, they may place seniors in it. Is that a requirement coming from the density? In other words, you can only build density if it includes affordable and or elder housing. Is that correct? I think it's contingent. Their funding is contingent on right. having it mixed. Yeah. All right, you need nothing other than our uh, signature approval. No, thank you. All right. They call it multi use housing. Multi use? That sounds right. All right, strong house liquor license request. Okay, so there's been a change um, in ownership at Strong House, as everyone should be aware. Um, there's also been a change, and Joan may be able to speak to this better than I, regarding the state's requirements from the municipality. Um, Joan, are they required to make a motion and, and pass, a re pass? Approve it. Ap approve it, okay. So this is for a liquor license um, at the Strong House Inn. And this is for a third class liquor license. This is fallen under the new laws that started July 1st. The local control commissioners didn't used to have to approve these, but you do now. This just started. So we always get a blanket um, waiver from them. All we need from you is someone to motion to approve it in a second, and then we just stick a label on it rather than send it around for everyone to sign for a half an hour. Then I'll make the motion to approve it. Motion to be seconded. <clears throat> Any further questions? Just a 
So a strong house inn is owned by a strong horse hospitality. That's the okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. we we didn't mean to confuse the whole. That's okay. Thing. I just like. <laughs> The writing is too perfect to have made just a typo there, so I'm assuming. I just was curious if that was like, you know, uh, Park Squeeze is not run by Park Squeeze, is what? Right. right. Park Squid or something? Yeah. yeah. So I just was curious. <laughs> All right. Motion made and seconded. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. You're very welcome. You. Welcome. Thank you. Appointment of the city manager. Does that just require an, a, a motion from someone? It does. Make the motion. A second. Jeez, don't everyone jump. It's okay. <laughs> the, the motion has been made and seconded. Were there any questions or pleas or comments? All those in favor, please say. Is this for say. a period of 10 years? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think that's perfect, yeah. Indentured <laughs> servitude. Indentured, I indentured servitude. Work off my death. I understand. All yeah. right. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Welcome. Thank you all. Congratulations. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. City manager's report. So as I'm sure everyone is aware, um, the state um, is, has, is being infested by the Eastern Emerald Ash Borer. It started down in Bennington uh, several years ago, and it has recently been uh, found in Bristol. And the unfortunate news uh, regarding the um, Eastern Emerald Ash Borer is that it's, it's virtually unstoppable. Uh, there are three options that are presented to, to municipalities. One uh, is to treat the trees. Uh, it is extremely cost prohibitive. I think it's $600 per tree for a two-year period. Uh, the second option is to cut the trees um, as they are currently alive and well to mitigate the spread. And the third is to deal with them uh, after they have already been infected. Uh, there's a pretty significant period of time between when the ash borer um, infects a tree and when it becomes visible. And basically by the time it's visible, uh, the tree is, is, is gonna be lost. Um, the problem with allowing the tree to die of, uh, from the infestation is that the wood becomes extremely brittle and um, to the point that, you know, power equipment running near an ash tree uh, may cause enough ground vibration that would cause limbs to fall off the tree. And uh, obviously once the tree becomes that brittle, it become, the wood becomes unusable. Um, of particular concern to Virgens is uh, Crosby Court, um, Adele Drive in that area. I think there are over a hundred ash trees in that complex alone. Um, and if you imagine going through and defoliating Crosby Court, uh, it would have a significantly different composition than it does at present. Um, the city has a budget of $5,000 for tree uh, stump removal and for replanting. And um, this isn't something I think we're going to be able to ignore. I think we can slow roll it to the next budget. But we're really going to have to figure out um, a, you know, a very short term solution uh, to an impending problem. Uh, Middlebury has got a, a couple of ash trees on their city green that they're going to go through the process of um, trying to treat them and trying to protect them. I took a walk through our city green today. I didn't see any uh, ash trees there, which is good news. I do have a study that was done in November of 1998, so I'm not sure uh, how valid that is regarding our inventory, but it really requires uh, DPW supervisor Jim Laro and I to be boots on the ground and trying to understand, you know, exactly where these trees are and where the larger liabilities are. Obviously, uh, if there's one up in the Macintosh Park, we're probably not as concerned, but if it's, you know, lining McDonough Drive, you know, that's a different topic of conversation for us. Um, and Jim and I are actively getting all the information that we can, but it really comes down to these three options. So this is really just kind of an FYI that there will be more on this topic 
uh, going forward. Um, from a sorry. Are there grants? I mean, I know this is a, a Vermont statewide problem. This is a, a national problem. Are there grants available that we've seen that could help replant, reforest mm -hmm. these areas? I haven't seen anything come through yet, David, but it mm -hmm. is on my radar. Yeah. Um, I think that the spread has surprised the state, uh, frankly. I mean, I think we thought it was southwest, uh, and it was really kind of contained there. And I think it, being in Bristol really kind of was a wake-up call. I think last year was the first time they found one in Vermont. Yeah. Or found so, it uh, amazing that, you know, it jumps you know, 150 miles north um, yeah. as quickly as it did. But, you know, they're not, there's not a lot of good news coming out of um, natural resources about, you know, the potential to not be significantly impacted. I think Bristol is a lot more on their on their green in downtown too. Um, Do you have any you know. knowledge of what we might be able to get if we were to cut healthy trees? Could we sell that as some sort of salvage lumber and what that a tree is, would cost? Uh, that is part of my process, Mark, will be to see, you know, if we were to you know, this is a great project for us to work with Northland's Job Corps on, as they do have a very robust urban forestry program. You know, if we could get the trees felled and bucked up, move the wood along either by way of lumber or firewood, could we take that and reinvest it back into a replanting strategy? Well, or, or treat. So if you could get $600 for a tree that comes down, then for every tree that comes down, you could treat a tree. So yeah. Right. I, 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 I will keep that on the agenda, uh, but... You know, if it's six, you know, like I said, I think there's a hundred trees in right. in Crosby Court, um, and they're this, not that big either. No, right? no, no, they're they're twenty, thirty feet. They're not. They're yeah, they're, you know, it's they're yeah, seven so or eight maybe inch diameter bus, trees, and you could buy some saplings. For yeah. It, so yeah. So generate well, that to go back. There's other ways. You know, there are a couple of different ways to slice and dice it. We'll certainly go to the state and see if there is any funding available, but. Um, there will be more on this coming. It's really just kind of an FYI, and that it just hit our hit our radar. Um, any other questions there, folks? Um, revised uh, Virginia's Police Department fee schedule was on the table when you came in today. Um, Chief Merkel uh, reached out and canvassed Bristol, Brandon, Middlebury, um, and then he and I reconvened uh, on this topic. I think that we've taken kind of the best of the three other municipalities and kind of adopted them as our own without trying to reinvent the wheel. You know, the objective continues to be for, you know, residents that we're not passing along the fee charge to, you know, for fingerprinting, VIN verification, um, and the rest of it is self-evident. If there are any questions, I would be glad. Or one topic of conversation had been regarding officer rate, should we be charging you know, at the at a premium rate, which would be you know Chief Merkel's rate, um, it's not consistent with what's being done in other municipalities. It is the officer rate um, and benefits, and then if it's a nonprofit or a for-profit organization, there's an additional 10% surcharge that it's added. And we're not charging for any of these services now. What is the what is the increase or? change? I don't think that we've been consistent um, in charging and I think part of this uh, David is to um, delineate where our responsibilities are as a police force right. and and saying you know Ferrisburg is Ferrisburg and, and they're not residents of Virgins and therefore would be facing a VIN verification which we may not have been doing in the past. Thank you. You don't need a motion on this. This is something that you would just as yeah, it's really manager I, implement. Yep, I believe that's within my responsibility. I, I think that um, you know, regardless of what other municipalities may or may not doing, um, the bottom line police officer services doesn't really make any sense because it's not dependent on whoever the officer is because there's other costs that go into providing police services. It, it's not just somebody with a uniform, a badge, and a gun showing up. Mm -hmm. The fact that we have the cost of the facility and the infrastructure and everything else. So um, I would revisit that piece of it. Okay. Any other questions or comments, folks? Okay. Thank you.
So paving update. Um, Supervisor Laro had a very aggressive paving schedule um, for this year, which was significantly compromised by the late spring, and now we can't get any uh, asphalt, basically. Um, so just teeing up for next year uh, will be our um, projects that have not been touched in many, many years, which is Scoville, Union, Elm, Prospect, Green Meadow Acres, and Meadowbrook Road are all going to be teed up for paving, um, hopefully early spring um, of, of 2020. And then there's going to be a top coat applied down a Commodore Drive, but that's being done. Uh, we will be assisting with the execution, but the money's been set aside by the developer to do that that project. You, um, you wasn't on that one because it did the paving and the sidewalk the same year. Yep. Can we take a look at that for you, um, Just, Bill? Uh, yeah, I'm curious. Sure. Yeah, I remember when that was done. But the rest of them, I have no problem with. <laughs> okay. I'll get back here on you. Yeah, that's fine. So that's really just an FYI, and again, we I think I had communicated earlier that we were we did have an aggressive paving schedule, but we just so can't. this is now going to happen in the spring, weather permitting, as opposed to the fall. Correct, of 2020. If it doesn't happen in the spring again, it just we'll just have a surplus and try and figure it out. We're going to get it done. Sooner, sooner or later, sooner or later. Okay. you can't you know mother nature was not uh, not great to us um, in that regard um, however moving on to topic d in spite of a very uh, rainy spring and not being able to get the docks in on time our dock revenue if you want to call it that is is only about 211 dollars off the last year number period to period, uh, which is interesting. Um, I don't know if anybody's been down there over the last couple of weeks, but it's, it's they're, you know, they're side to side to side. Um, and again, I continue to look at, um, you know, how we continue to develop that asset. Um, the Virgin's partnership is assisting me in pursuing the BIG grant, which is the boating infrastructure grant that I had discussed at our last city council meeting. Um, and you know, there's some conversation internally as to do we need some remediation work done to some of the metal sheeting on the um, on the Falls Park side, or should we be going after docks and, and new electrical? Uh, so we'll see what the outcome of that, that grant opportunity is. But I think it bodes well that as, as late as we got in, um, you know, we're still seeing a lot of traffic and it's definitely driving. Well, the don't come down until July. Yep. So What's the total amount? It's still not a lot of money. No, it's not 3, a thousand bucks. Yeah, I mean, currently we're at eleven oh four. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. It's not a it's not a big chunk, yeah. um, Bill. But you know, I you know I've talked to a lot more boaters this year than I think I ever have in the seventeen years I've been here, and you know I think that there is an opportunity for us to continue to develop the asset to the point that we could be charging. A modest fee yeah. um, you know that comes into you know who's down there taking the money and etc but you know I, I think that there's an opportunity there and the boaters that I have spoken to are very satisfied with our current service and have said listen we'd pay a buck a foot not even think twice about it yeah. um, but you know if we well if you had some showers if you had power on both sides yep. and water I mean it's if you have basic amenity base on harbor is 350 a foot right so I, you know, I would think that if we just keep it clean and provide basic things and, and have someone that actually administers it, yep. manages it. Camera too, I mean, you got to know. Yeah. Come on, up here if you're at. Yeah, so I'm not sure if that was raised in the last um, conversation I about I, this. I think I saw it in the it notes. We, we've last talked week. about it for yeah. a few years, trying yeah. to figure out the best way to do it, and I, I'm not sure how that is, but yeah, yeah it's a good idea. So, again, um, so, you know, kind of good news there in spite of our rainy spring. Um, Everyone received a picture of the Falls Park Gate project. Um, this was uh, Mike Daniel's um, original uh, concept, and he was instrumental in assisting in getting the gates built, and DPW got them uh, installed last week. So you may recall uh, the former setup as you came through the parking lot, the gates were hard to the right-hand side, 
and you really had to walk around the gate and past a boulder to get over to where the true path was. And what's happened is, as you look at the picture, you know, we have a gate that's separated, large enough egress for people to walk through, and it leads them directly to the path without this um, loop around. So a thank you to Mike, uh, Mike um, Daniels for the concept, the implementation, and for the DPW guys for, for getting it input. I, I really think it just has kind of changed the entire uh, feeling over there. Um, so great job to everyone there. Um, that is the bulk of my report today, Mr. Mayor. Great. Anyone have any questions for the manager? I wanted to briefly update everyone on the Panton Planning Commission meeting, which was now two weeks ago yep. yesterday I believe um, it was fairly well attended there were uh, about 30 people present I'm happy to report there were uh, there were very few very few people there pushing back on the project uh, there were lots of questions asked of uh, Mike Winslow who made the presentation um, he addressed all of the questions that were asked of him and the uh, planning commission reported that they were going to take it up as a topic at their next meeting they feel that should they endorse this project they need to amend their town plan which has a statement in uh, opposition to the construction of a bypass route which was formerly terminating in panton um, so the case is actually pretty easy to be made that this this route is not that route and there we're comparing apples and oranges uh, but they're willing to proceed and um, that was pretty exciting for us actually is that um, how would they make that change they have to go through the process to amend their town plan which goes through uh, they're probably better Luckily better people we have plenty of time yeah sure. we have sure. plenty of time but it's a, it's a vote it's a town vote they're gonna Yes, and town meeting. Another right. legislative vote and then another town vote. Right. Yes. Sure. Right. Three year process. But it's important for us to remember that uh, that's really been the only pushback or even minimal resistance that we've seen through this whole project. So yeah. the rest of our neighbors are all on board. And uh, we continue to talk about it. I continue to have a lot of conversations about it, which is great. I hope everyone saw the letter that uh, Adam Lucci wrote and was published in the independent that was an excellent letter a lot of really good information uh any other comments on your questions of me on that would they want to change their charter just as a just in case we do have to change the route because if it's not i don't Panton, i don't know but i'm not going to mention does. that to them so if i could just jump in on yeah. that um Joe Segali, who works in Secretary Flynn's uh, Office of Agency of Transportation, brought this to our attention very, very early in this uh, recent permutation of the VEC and uh, specifically called out the fact that Panton does have this sent one sentence uh, in their town plan. And uh, that's really was the marching orders for the mayor and I to start to develop the regional consensus, which is what we've done over the last several months. Um, so. You know, our contention continues to be that Virgens is going to solve this and pulling it within our city limits uh, greatly assists us, Mark, in being able to do that. You know, I, I really want to make sure that they are all on board, too, because it's going to impact them whether it touches their ground or not. I just wasn't sure if it stays inside Virgens city limits, does it matter what their town charter says? Well, the charter specifically says... They don't support a corridor going, ending in Panton. If to be is, clear, it's actually the plan and not the charter. Right. Oh, so, okay. I, I mean, it's, it's the town plan. I mean, it, if it were the charter, that would be a completely different issue, but it, it's not. <laughs> okay. It's the town plan. Any other questions? Uh, we are actually getting some traction on our succession planning committee. I have uh, thrown a couple of lines out in the water and I'm expecting a hard nibble very soon um, <clears throat> for this group to get together. It's important we get started on that and um, we'll, I hopefully report at the next meeting that the group is ready to go. Uh, local option tax, uh, we, Matt and I met with Rennie Perry, president of the Virgins Partnership last week uh, to discuss 
what we need to know and what homework we need to do to plan for implementation of the local option tax. It seemed to me a natural request of the city to ask the partnership to take that task on and uh, uh, Rennie did agree with that. So we are going to meet uh, very soon. There were some pieces of information that the city manager is going to gather for us and uh, we'll get a meeting on the table to get started on that soon. So we do indeed have that underway. Any questions on the local option tax? Uh, the last thing I wanted to uh, mention tonight is I would like to extend uh, this council's condolences to the family of Roger Hayes. Uh, Roger was uh, an alderman for a number of years, a longtime resident, and you'll all remember that his daughter Carrie served on our city manager search committee, and uh, she has uh, had a summer of loss herself. So our condolences to them. Please keep them all in mind. And that was all I had for this evening. That being said, I'll make the motion to adjourn. Motion made. Second. And seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Meeting adjourned. Thank you.